Okay, so we will be finishing Matthew chapter 5 tonight. Uh, we'll be in verse 33 and go to verse six, uh, 48. And what we're going to be seeing here is how do we live in a society that is opposed to Jesus and therefore opposed to us. That's what Jesus is going to be talking about tonight. And uh, you guys might have been experiencing it where you are coming up to opposition and you are wanting to live a life glorifying to Christ, and then you find people that are just against you. How do we live a Christ-glorifying life in front of that opposition? And that's what Jesus is going to be revealing to us tonight. So we're going to uh, start in verse 33, and I'm going to read to the end of the chapter, then we'll talk about it, okay? Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make your hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your cloak, let him have your, uh, and sorry, and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, <clears throat> and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, anything you liked in that? I like how we're being pushed one step further to do good to our enemies and to just essentially leave it in God's hands to deal with <clears throat> those that are bad. Yeah. It's a hard thing to do, right? Because our flesh wants to, Very. at least my flesh wants to pulverize them. Mm -hmm. Like our, my flesh, you know, my, people that, that go against me, sometimes I want to show them who's boss. And Jesus has to remind me, <clears throat> you're not Lord of your life anymore, Jason. I am. So, yeah. Yep. Anyone else? Well, this is perfect for me tonight, having mm -hmm. the day yeah. <laughs> that I have had. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, and just the anxiety that came up with everything that hit me today. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I got in my car, 
and went a quarter of a block to the stop sign, praying through it, I was fine. Good. Good. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Well, let's break this down. Let's start in verse uh, 33. Now, remember, this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus speaking. Again, well, before we get into this, do you remember the people group that Matthew was written to? Was it the Jews? The Jews, you're right. So, everything in this section that we're reading tonight is very particular to the Jewish people. And the first rule, the, well, not the first rule, the first rule is context, context, context when it comes to Bible interpretation. The second rule is what did it mean for the original reader? Okay. And I practice something when, when I teach. It's called exegesis. That's a big word. And it comes from the word to exegete. And to exegete means to pull out from. And so what we need to do tonight is we need to look at this. What did it mean for the original reader? Okay. Find that principle, and then that principle is the right interpretation, and then we can find the application. Okay? So let's talk about it. Jesus says, again, you have heard that it uh, was said of old, you shall not swear falsely. Okay? Where was that said? You guys know? Commandments? You're right. Ten commandments. Ten commandments. Okay, it's, I think it's the seventh commandment. You shall not bear false witness. Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you should perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Now, this is going all the way back to what's called the Mosaic Covenant. When Moses went up on the mountain, <clears throat> for 40 days, he says, this is what the Lord is offering you. This is what the Lord wants you to do. And the Jews, uh, well, the Israelites were said, whatever the Lord says, we're going to do. And from that point on, they have rebelled against the Lord. The Lord has drawn them back. They've come back to the Lord. They rebel against the Lord. And it was constant rebellion. Okay. But you shall perform what the Lord uh but you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Get back, and when you say, Lord, I will do your commandments, we must do that. But I say to you, now notice. Who are we performing this to? Is it to other people? To the but Lord. To the Lord, okay. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Either by heaven, for it is the throne of God. So what, what, what do you think Jesus is saying? He's saying don't take oaths at all. Is it? Um, 
So I think I've been in um, <clears throat> a court situation where I've been told, oh, you swear on the Bible? And I've, I've declined and well, mm-hmm. my yes is my yes mm-hmm. and my no is my no. You may affirm me. Mm-hmm. And that was acceptable. And then they go, God's busy moving a mountain. I don't think he has time to mm-hmm. put that down mm-hmm. and come and, and be your witness. Like, like, like uh, I don't think we command God like that. Um. You know what? If I ever had to go to court and swear on a Bible, I'd probably say, before I swear on this Bible, you know what this Bible says? Because if I swear on this Bible, all of you are going to jail. Because you have not performed what's in this Bible. Amen? Amen. So, you shall not swear or take an oath at all, either by heaven. Because what is heaven according to to Jesus in this verse? God's kingdom. God's throne. God's throne does not belong to me. That's like me saying, I swear by Trump Tower. I don't own Trump Tower. Therefore, I can't swear by it. Okay? Or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Are you noticing a pattern here? Who does heaven belong to? God. Who does earth belong to? God. God. Or by Jerusalem. Remember, who's he talking to? Who's the original hearers of this? The Jews. Okay. And why do we not, why were they not supposed to swear by Jerusalem? Because they are his people. Is that what it says? It's the city of the great king. Okay. It doesn't belong to them. It uh, no. Who does it belong to? God. How do God. we know it? How do we know it belongs to God? Do you know? Like, why not? Don't swear by Edmonton. How do we know that Jerusalem belongs to God? In the Psalms, God says, I have placed my name on Jerusalem. And when you take an aerial view of Jerusalem, you will see the letters imprinted in the hills and valleys. Yod, Ve, Vod, Ve, which is wow. Yahweh, the I am the covenant name of God is imprinted on Jerusalem. So heaven, heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. Jerusalem is the city of the great king because the great king's name is imprinted embossed on that city. Okay? And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Who does your head belong to? You? God. God. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than than this comes from good. Is that what it says? Uh, no way. No. No. What does evil. it say? Comes from um, evil. Anything else comes from evil. 
Okay. I want you to see something here. The reason why we as believers do not make an oath by anything, heaven belongs to God, earth belongs to God. Jerusalem has God's name embossed in it. I belong to God. And everything God has given me has been a gift from God himself. Everything that I can taste, feel, touch, see, hear is not mine and smell is not mine it is god's and i have no privileged authority to swear by something that belongs to god so what is jesus really showing us here. Not only do uh, the right way to take an oath, which is either yes or no, but what is he really showing us? That he owns everything. He is king of kings, lord of lords. I have no rights to his possessions. The only rights I have is what he gifts me. And he has the right to take that gift away whenever he wants to, minus salvation, because God promises he will never take that gift away. So this is showing us the supreme lordship of Jesus Christ. And so we cannot swear by anything because it doesn't belong to me. Just like saying, I swear by Trump Tower, it doesn't belong to me. Okay. Let's go into verse 38. We will be spending most of our time in this area on retaliation. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And that's in Leviticus 24, and we're going to be looking at that. Remember, there are three major things in Bible, Bible interpretation. Context, context, context. Okay. So what did we just learn about oaths? Why don't we make oaths? Because nothing because belongs to nothing us. Nothing belongs to us. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. Because Jesus that, that's right. Therefore, Jesus is Lord over everything. That's number one. Number two, who's the original? hearers of this who's the original readers of this the jewish people the jewish people so they will understand this story in leviticus 24 okay you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but i say to you do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the majority of people uh, are they left handed or right handed? The majority. Right, right handed. Okay. So now, 
if I take my right hand and slap you on your right cheek, what will it look like? Will it look like this or will it look like this? Backhanded. 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 So if I gave you a backhanded slap, that's an insult, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Now, for the rest of the story, to understand what Jesus is talking about, turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 24, and we are going to read verses 10 to 23. Tell me when you're there. I'm there. Okay. Yep. Okay. What was the chapter? Chapter 20, Leviticus 24, 2, 4, verses 10 to the end of the chapter. Okay. I'm going to start reading here. Now an Israelite's now an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the people of Israel. And the Israelite's woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. So we have an outsider, okay, like a half breed, really, fighting with a purebred. And they fought in the camp, and the Israelite's woman's son blasphemed the name. So the half-breed blasphemed the name and cursed. Then they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shalomith, the daughter of Debris, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody till the will of the Lord should be clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him, and speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, <clears throat> when he blasphemes the name shall be put to death. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good life. For life. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury has been given a person shall be given to him. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, and whoever kills a person shall be put to death. You shall have the same rule for the sojourner. And for the native, for I am the Lord your God. So Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and they brought out of the camp the one who had cursed and stoned him with stones. Thus the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded. Okay. Let's talk about this now. We have the half breed, and we have. The native born Israelite. And the half breed and the native born somehow got into a fight. Speculation here, 100% speculation. 
But do you think it had anything to do with the guy being a half breed? Probably. Because if it didn't, it wouldn't be part of the story. Okay. Now, what happened? And the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. We don't know who started the fight. But we do know this. From the fight, this half-breed cursed God. He blasphemed the name and he cursed. Then, God says you need to stone him. But when did they stone him? That is the most important question. After they had sought God? God gave some commandments. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Whoever kills a person, this was not killing. This was, like, uh, this was not murdering. This was justice. Okay? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, an animal for an animal. And then after that, they killed him. After that, they stoned him for blaspheming the name. Now that we understand that story a little bit, let's go back to Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. These people being Jewish, what story are they in their mind automatically going back to? Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24. They know the story. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If you are resisting an evil one, and you're going back to the story, what do you think you're doing? Perpetuating it? You're fighting? You're fighting now. Okay, what happened because of the fight? Out of anger, God got cursed. Someone cursed God, blasphemed God. Because one of them was resisting the other one. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay. We need to go back to this thing about oaths. Good boy. What is the oath all about? What is this thing about oaths all about? Is it is oaths the primary thing here? No, God owns everything. The the supreme lordship. And now this story is about blaspheming the supreme king.
But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If he insults you for being a half-breed, or you insult him because he's a full-blood and you're a half-breed, I don't care. The insulting and the resisting will lead to fighting. And it's not the fighting God's concerned about. It's the blaspheming of his name. God doesn't want your actions against an evil person to make that evil person blaspheme the name of God. It says, turn to him the other also. And if anyone should sue you and take your tunic, your tunic is your outer cloak, let him have your cloak as well. Why do you think God says that? This is why. In the Old Testament law, it was illegal to, to take someone's cloak for the whole day. Because of the poverty of people, sometimes that's the only thing they owned. It was their only possession, and it was the only thing to keep them warm at night. And he's saying, look, you want that? Take this also. Take what you're not supposed to have, because you got to give it back to me anyway. Look, I would much rather you not blaspheme God. I want to bless you in such a way that it will be impossible for you to blaspheme God because of my actions. So when we look at oaths, we see the supreme lordship of Jesus Christ. And now when we're looking at this, We're seeing the supreme value in the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we do not ever use his name improperly. Is this starting to make sense now? Totally. Yep. Let's keep reading. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. People, uh, have you ever heard that phrase, go the extra mile? Yep. Okay, that comes from here. But the way that people use it today, totally bogus has nothing to do with the original meaning. Okay. You need to know Israelite history. A lot of you are following my Jeremiah series. And what is about to happen in Jeremiah, if you're following my Jeremiah series, what's about to happen? Deb, I know you know. Sorry, I'm having a coughing fit. Oh, that's fine. So what's going to happen is God is about to destroy Jerusalem and kick a bunch of people out to go to Babylon. And in 586 B.C., Babylon, I'm sorry, uh, Israel, lost its national sovereignty. 586 BC. It took almost 25, or just over 20, 
just over just about 2,500 years, just over 2,000 years, I guess, to get their national sovereignty back. What that means is after that, they could still live in the land. They came back 70 years later from Babylon, but they were always ruled over by another empire. First, it was the Babylonians. Then it was the uh, Medo-Persian. Then it was Greece. And then it was Rome. And so now, Rome has Israel as a province. They don't have the IDF walking around. They have Roman soldiers walking around. And Roman soldiers would carry a rucksack, just like our soldiers do. And those rucksacks get heavy. And the law of the day was a Roman soldier could come up to your house, knock on your door, and force you to carry that heavy rucksack of his a mile. And so what the Jews would do is they would measure a mile from, from their doorstep every direction. And what they would do is they'd take that rucksack and they would walk with that soldier a mile, drop it right at that mile marker, spit on the ground, filthy, stupid, stinking Roman, and walk back. Now, now that you know the story, Jesus says, if someone forces you to go with a mile, go, go a mile, go with him how many? Two. Did the Romans know which God they worshipped, which God the Jews worshipped? Not personally. No, but they knew about, right? Yes. Now, I want you to put yourself in a Roman soldier's shoes. These little pissant Jews in their mind. I'm going to force them to take my rucksack because I can, and they are the filth of the earth. And the sentiment was the same in the Jewish mind and the Jewish heart for a Roman. Now, if a Jew went past that mile marker, being very happy and going an extra mile, would that Roman soldier blaspheme his God, blaspheme the God of Israel? No. Do you think maybe that Roman soldier might have some questions? Like, dude, you're weird. What's up? You've been smoking some Mary Jane. What's going on? You don't have to... 100%. Oh, oh, okay, okay. And so now when he said, let's say that the Roman soldier said, you've been smoking some cannabis there, boy? Like, what's going on? There's something not right here. And when the Jew says, my Lord commands me to bless you, so I must. You see lordship, lordship, lordship. Do you think that's going to mess with that Roman soldier's head? And the Roman also would understand authority, so that would really speak to him. That's right. The Roman uh, Roman soldier understands authority, and so now 
the Jew who follows the teachings of Christ is doing what Christ says, which messes with his head. Not to play mind games, but now to ask, who is this God that wants to bless the enemy of Israel? Will that Roman soldier want to blaspheme God? No, he's going to want to know more about it. Let's keep reading. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. <clears throat> There's an old joke that Jews tell. And I can't really remember it that well. I probably shouldn't tell if I can't remember it. But it's something about, I'll throw my money up. And whatever stays in heaven is God's. And whatever lands on the earth is mine. Jews are known about their wealth their money management, their hoarding of money, and, and holding <laughs> on to it. Um, I think we're inviting more problems. You know, have, have, you ever, have you ever heard this? That guy gypped me. I'm old enough to remember. Your mic is on. What's that? Hey, Chris, your mic's on. Chris, your mic is on. Oh, oh, we're definitely suing. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's getting tapped on. Hey, that's Chris, mm -hmm. Chris, mm -hmm. your mic's on. Oh, there, gotcha. Okay, um, so now I remember being old enough. Or be, I guess I was young enough. I didn't understand what they were saying, but they said, that guy Jewed me. You guys ever hear that? Now they say they Jewed yeah. me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they swindled the money out of me. And so now, Jesus is saying to the Jews that follow him, give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, here's something in the Jewish law, in the in the Torah, in the in in the first five books of the Bible. Jews know money. They know how money works. They know how to make money with money. But the law says in the Old Testament, you are not allowed to charge your brother or anyone else in Israel, usury, meaning you can't charge them interest. Is a Jew going to want to lend money that he's not getting money back on? Nope. nope. And Jesus is saying, do not refuse the one who would borrow. Let's see, what would that do to the other Jewish people? A Jewish beggar, and a Jew gives to him freely. Okay, I know of the God we worship, but you're not acting like religious Jewish people should. What gives? You're freely lending me money? This doesn't make sense, Hezekiah. You see that everything here, it starts off with the lordship and the ownership that God has over everything and everyone. The next thing is not wanting to blaspheme the name of God, but to bless the name of God. 
It all points back to Jesus. It points them all in the direction. Everything we are to do is to point people back to the King of Kings. If our lives are not directing people to Jesus, they are not going to believe the gospel we preach of Jesus. Interesting, in 1 Peter 3, it talks about um, our conduct when we're mistreated being in such a way that um, that is so honorable, honoring God, that they will be ashamed that mistreat us. Yeah, that's right. Which brings us to verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's nowhere in scripture. That was an oh, extra biblical teaching. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Oh. That's interesting. Is everybody so, frozen? No, no, I was just reading something. So it says, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Go back to chapter 5, verse 9. You cut out there, Jason. Go back to Matthew 5, 9. And Jesus says, this is in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Whose job is it to initiate peace? Ours. Now, let's talk about the Apostle Paul. Before the Apostle Paul was a Christian, what was he? He was a murderer. He was a was Jewish, bad. he was a Jewish terrorist. Yeah. He was a Jewish, a, a devout religious Jewish terrorist. He killed Christians and imprisoned Christians. Do you think these Christians of the day were praying for Paul, or at that time Saul of Tarsus, because they were persecuting him. Well, think of Stephen. He would have, he held the coats of the men who were stoning Stephen, and he saw Stephen's face shone like an angel and uh, it, seeing Jesus. So pretty impacting, I would imagine. Yeah. That's right. I think so. Yeah. So, okay. And it says, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. <clears throat> Not counting adoption. Biological son. Will he be, will he look like his father? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now. Now. 
I remember a while ago, I was talking to a newer believer. And this, this newer believer, he grew up Mormon, hasn't been to church in 25 years, and then got saved. And we were talking, and he says, but I always believed in Jesus. Okay. We're going to see Ian. Well, before I get to that, in our Western mindset, we equate belief with intellectual agreement. But here's what the book of James says. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, You believe that God is one? Great. Even the demons believe that, and they tremble. Let me put it another way. You believe that Jesus is the eternal God. You believe that he was born of the Virgin Mary. You believe that he led that he lived a sinless life. You believe that he died on the cross for a, as a propitiation for our sins. You believe that he was buried, and you believe that on the third day he rose again to life. Good. Even the demons believe that and tremble. Keep your finger here. Go to John chapter 3. We're going to look at John 3.16 and then John 3.36. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I am reading from the English Standard Version, and this is another one of those reasons why I prefer the English Standard Version, because it's so much more precise. John 3.36. Still Jesus speaking, and he defines belief. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So what does Jesus equate obedience with? Sorry, belief with. Obedience. Obedience. Now, here's the conundrum. We are saved by grace, through faith, not of works. My works don't save me. My obedience to Jesus doesn't save me. But yet, he says, whoever believes in me has eternal life. Who does, whoever does not obey the Son does not have life, and the wrath of God remains on him. Which one is it? Well, it's because obedience proves that you believe. Okay. I'm glad you said that, George. Yeah, it's both. Okay. This is where we get what's called the doctrine of effectual calling. When you believe, when you truly believe, your life will change. Let me give you an example. When we get to Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is going to say something very profound. A tree is known by its fruit. When you're looking at a lemon tree, how do you know it's a lemon tree? It has lemons. It has lemons. Now, great. 
I think this is a really good point here. Everybody's born a lemon tree because they're all sour and we're all sinners. Sinners are sour, just like lemons are. You can be a lemon tree. Let me let me put this before I get to to that. Let me do this. In today's culture, we have men saying, "I believe I'm a woman," and we look at them, and we're saying. Johnny, you're no Judy. You know what I mean? Just because a person says they believe that they're a different gender does not make them that gender. Because they go through an operation or a religious ritual does not make them that other gender. So let's go back to the tree. Just because you say, I've said the prayer, I've confessed Jesus as Lord, and I've been baptized. And a Christian tree is supposed to be an apple tree. But if your tree is still producing lemons, you can say you're an apple tree all day long. Are you an apple tree? No. You see how I brought those two together, the trees and what, what's happening today. What do we call you? Delusional. Okay. But I say to you, love your enemies. And I pray for those who, and, and pray for those who, persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. If you want to look like an apple tree, you need to act like an apple tree. And the only way you can act like an apple tree is if God has done his regenerating work in you. The Lord of heaven and earth tells us not to make an oath because everything belongs to him. We do not retaliate against people. We bless them so people will not blaspheme my God, my Jesus, but rather bless my Jesus. I love my enemy because my Jesus is my Lord, and I look like my Father in heaven, <laughs> because I truly believe. If you believe Jesus is Lord, you will live as Jesus is Lord. So that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. This is called God's benevolent love. This is not God's salvific love. This is God's benevolent love. This shows the goodness of God that he blesses the righteous and he blesses the unrighteous. And so we must do the same. And we do it for the glory of the name 
of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, so that those who look at us will see that we are an apple tree and not a lemon tree. And say, how did you become an apple tree? God changed me. And you then get to share the gospel. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? So now, there's a reward involved with this. Salvation is not a reward. It is a gift. This is the second time in Matthew we've talked about rewards. The first one is at the end of the Beatitudes. Do not even the tax collectors do the same thing. Look, all of us hate CRA. We hate them. They take way too much of our money. But these tax collectors were even worse. You see, they were Jewish people who defected and went to work for the Romans. And the way that they had to make money is they had to tack their fee on top of the taxes. And they were extorting their own people because they defected to Rome. They were the lowest of the low. And saying, tax collectors do that. You need to be better than that. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Remember, who's this book written to? Jews or Gentiles? The Jewish. Okay, so now he's saying, look at the Gentiles. They do that. You're supposed to be different, Jewish people. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh oh. Now we got to look at what perfection is. And in these three sections, we see it. Will we ever be perfect on earth? No. So what we can conclude, what perfection is. Number one. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he owns everything, even everything in my life. Therefore, I can't swear by it. I can only say yes or no. Number two, we don't resist the evil person because we do not want them to blaspheme the name of God, but rather bless the name of God. And because God has a benevolent love on the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous, we show that same love even to the unrighteous because of the glory of his name. And to use God's benevolent love through us to point the unrighteous to Jesus so they can experience his salvific love when we've earned the right to share the gospel. And the way that we earn the right to share the gospel is we market Jesus properly.
Jesus is perfect, and we must love people the way that Jesus loves people. I want to go to Romans chapter 5, and we'll close with this. Romans 5. We're going to start in verse 8. Well, we'll start in verse 6. And we'll go down to 10. Uh, we'll go down to verse 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Who did Christ die for? Ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, unjust, unrighteous, unholy, blaspheming the name of God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified, meaning justice has been served, now that we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Much more, uh, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have received reconciliation. We are known as children of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords when we love our enemies with a benevolent love. And when people see us, the apple tree, not the lemon tree, not the lemon tree that's pretending to be the apple tree. When he sees us as the apple tree, when these sinners, these enemies of God, see us as the apple tree, they will see what God looks like. Because we look like our Father. And they will see God's true love, His benevolent love. And like the one who slapped you on the side of the cheek, you did not go against Him because you wanted Him to bless your Father and not curse your Father. And like the Roman soldier, you went an extra mile because you wanted him to bless this Jesus, your Jesus, your Lord, and not curse your Lord. And you love your enemies with a benevolent love so that they will see what God's benevolent love looks like in you. And they want to know the salvation style of the Father. Amen. 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 You know, there's a, uh, a saying I heard.